Welcome to Podcetera. Each episode is a journey of discovery as we delve into topics that pique our curiosity and yours. We feature in-depth interviews with fascinating individuals who have extraordinary stories to share. I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Ludovich. And this is Podcetera. You, welcome to Podcetera. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Should I say Hugh? Say whatever works for you. I'll answer to anything. Before we ask you a bit about yourself, let's dive in to this year's event. I'd like to know what sets this year apart. I think the much stronger, much more intense focus on AI, artificial intelligence in all its many forms. We saw a lot of this in 2023, which was in the immediate wake of the Chat GPT release in November 2022. We're seeing even more of it in 2024, even more of it being this focus on artificial intelligence, AI, and all its many forms. For 2024, we have a artificial intelligence track. That means four days of panels that are all devoted to AI in one form or another. But AI also is part of the other 23 tracks. How AI impacts music, how AI impacts film, how we're using AI to predict climate change, how we're using AI to come up with new food ideas how AI is impacting transportation, how it's impacting all kinds of things in our lives. So again, AI is big at South by Southwest, is big in our society, in our culture, in our worldview now. I think what one of the things that's bear saying here is that we're on this precipice of a new reality here with AI of how much this is changing our lives and will continue to change our lives. But we also have to acknowledge that AI is fully in a hype curve right now. It's way, way up here. If you can see my hand, it's way above my head. It will eventually come back down to a little bit more level, but hype curves have been, have always been pretty good for South by Southwest. A couple of years ago, it was not as intense as AI, but we had so much about crypto a couple of years ago. For many years, South by Southwest was the place to be to talk about social media. Again, these these hype curves, these waves, these these current events, trends have always been good for what we do. What are you seeing people on social media talking about most? What are they most excited about? I think, again, there's a lot of interest in AI. There's also certainly within the last two weeks, three weeks, with the release of the Apple Vision Pro, there's a new wave of interest in headsets, immersive experiences. That's good for creating more interest and the buzz there. I think as well, people are interested in future of work, workplace. That one, because we're still struggling with, are we work from home or are we work from office too? Because there's been so many layoffs the last month, two months, particularly with tech companies, but we're seeing it elsewhere also. So you can argue this cycles back to AI. Is AI taking these jobs? Maybe so, maybe no. I think there's a lot of fear in the economy right now. Can you share a bit about where you grew up and how your upbringing influenced your career path? I grew up here in Austin. It was certainly a much different place when I grew up than it is now. It was much more of a sleepy college town. My dad was a UT prof. UT is still a big part of Austin, a big part of the creative scene, and and certainly a big part of why South by Southwest evolved to be South by Southwest. But the city is no longer a sleepy college town. It is a big city at this point, and, and that is a big difference. In terms of where I grew up and how that impacted what I'm doing at South by Southwest now, I, I think that there, there's probably more impact there from where I went to school, where I, where I went to college. I went to a small college in Ohio called Kenyon College, which is very quintessential small liberal arts college. And I think that it, liberal arts approach that it's better to learn a little about a lot of things as opposed to a lot about a little of things has very much influenced my approach and the approach that, that I've tried to install with my staff at South by Southwest, where we, again, offer a lot of different kinds of content, different kinds of industries that all ultimately focus on 
creativity and this idea that bringing different kinds of creative people together can lead to new opportunities. So again, that very much aligns with the liberal arts ethos that, that I was exposed to for four years. Before South by Southwest became well-known worldwide, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in, in the early days? And you've been programming director for how long? I've been at the event for 30 plus years. How's that? I, I have been programming it or programming parts of it for quite a while. I, my current title is relatively new, last five or six years there. But certainly when we were younger, it was harder to get people to return our phone calls, our emails. Thankfully, it's a little bit easier now. So that's good. I think as well, one of the struggles that we faced earlier before we had become a little more well-known is really the flip side of that liberal arts idea where people would say, well, well what kind of event are you? I mean, are you a, a tech event or are you a music event or are you a film event or are you a event about design or are you a event about food? You're all these different things. And that seems really weird. I'd rather just go to one thing. And so that was a little bit of a hindrance for the early years of the event. I think that and again, that's one of our big strengths now that we bring together all these creative people, but it was not always that way. And, and certainly, you know, earlier in the life of the, the event, the conference of the festival, not as many people were familiar with Austin. What is Austin? I don't want to go there. And certainly, I think more people are familiar with Austin now, and that's certainly a big selling point of South by Southwest. Oh, I can come to this cool event. And I can also come to this city that I've heard a lot about. That sounds pretty neat. Would you mind sharing some of your top tips for festival goers, especially newbies, to get the most out of South By and their visit to Austin? I will certainly share my tips for success at South by Southwest. My number one tip, and I say this often, and it's not brain surgery, but it's prepare. Take some time before the event to think about what your goals are at South by Southwest, who you want to meet, what kind of people you want to meet, what you want to learn, what you want to take from the event, and then map those goals to the online schedule, i.e. come up with panels where you might meet these kinds of people, what meetups you want to go to, what networking events you want to go to, and then eventually translate that to a kind of day-by-day, hour-by-hour grid of where you want to be. I say this because South by Southwest, for better or for worse, is this pretty large event at this point, and it's easy to get overwhelmed if you don't have some kind of game plan of what you want to do. It is also much, much better to have a game plan and something really great comes up that you weren't planning for. Great. Give it to that. You won. I think you're going to be less successful if you just go in and hope that something better happens without some kind of game plan, you can be disappointed that way. You can be a little bit overwhelmed by that. Other things that are important, treat the event as a marathon, not a sprint. It's an eight-day event. While most people are not participating for eight days, even at three or four days, you can get exhausted pretty quickly. Don't stay out too late the first night unless you want to sleep the next day. Also, very, very basic, but wear comfortable shoes. You're probably going to be doing a lot of walking in Austin. Spring in Austin is fairly unpredictable. It can be pretty cold or it can be pretty warm. So bring a full range of clothing. Bring snacks too. If you're going to be out at the Austin Convention Center or a hotel looking at going to sessions all day, you can get hungry. So bring a power bar or fruit or something that you can have a quick snack, get some energy without having to go to a restaurant if, if that's not something you want to do. I think it all flows into just really having some kind of game plan strategy for success. The other thing I'll say here is that one of the big value propositions, one of the big things that's unique about South by Southwest as compared to a, a number of other great events is that we bring together so many different kinds of creative people from so many different industries. But when you're thinking about that game plan that strategy, I encourage you to think outside your comfort zone. Go to sessions that don't match your current expertise. Go to things you don't know anything about. 
You'll create new opportunities, learn new things there. Go to bands that you never heard of before, films that you're not familiar with, but wow, that seems weird. Stretch your boundaries. And that is, I think, where a lot of people get the most out of an event like South by Southwest, where they go to something they weren't familiar with. They meet new people, they create new opportunities that way, and that leads to big things down the road. I think you're absolutely right. I sat down next to a lot of people, had great conversations, and I'm still connected to these people years later that I've met at South by Southwest. And I encourage everybody to stop by Flatstock as well. I <laughs> and, love going in there every year and checking it out. It's really Leave cool. your wallet at home unless you <laughs> yes. want to. You know. <laughs> it is very cool. Joelle, look it up. You would love it. I don't think she's oh, going yet. <laughs> yeah, Flatstock is a giant poster <laughs> show. and It's amazing. I would love that. Yeah. I have so, closets full of posters that I bought at Flatstock that I was going to like, I don't put this up and they've stayed rolled up for X number of years, but it was an enjoyable experience buying them. The people that I have met at South by, I've, I've had lasting relationships. Great. That's awesome. And it could have been just sitting like we were at a, oh, we're at a happy hour and I struck up a conversation and oh, wow, this person is in air safety. Okay. You know, and then we, 10 years later, we're still connected. So Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll put that as another tip for success at South by Southwest or at other similar events is be friendly. Talk to the people next to you. You would never know what that small connection is going to lead to. And I hear so many stories like yours where someone says, the best connection I made was waiting in line for a taxi or an Uber. And the person next to me ended up knowing a VC that funded my startup. And that doesn't happen if you're not friendly or talkative or whatnot. So again, encourage people to be as outgoing, be as friendly, introduce yourself to people, be receptive to what the universe is throwing your way in terms of who she or he puts in front of you on a given day. And eat a lot of barbecue. (laughs) (laughs) That too. Yeah, that too. Okay. Hugh, what were your initial career aspirations and how did they lead you toward your role at South by Southwest? To the extent that I had career aspirations, Joelle, I (laughs) wanted to be a writer. I still want to be a writer when I grow up. I think that I am relatively adequate in terms of pumping out paragraphs and whatnot, and that it still is very helpful (laughs) in a lot of the things I do at South by Southwest. I have dreams and aspirations of one day being able to write a book, but the extent of my writing is pretty much social media, 280 characters or whatever Twitter is now. So uh, I haven't written that book yet. Maybe someday I will. (laughs) X, yes, X. But again, writing was was the thing that I really like to do. I still like to do it, but I, I haven't quite realized those dreams and aspirations yet. Could you shed light on the process of curating the film lineup and how do you strike a balance between promoting newcomers and accommodating established filmmakers within the festival? Across the board, whether it's bands for the music festival, films for the film and TV festival, panels for the conference, we have an application process. If people want to get involved, there's a time that they can apply. We'll typically get 60 to 70 percent of our content for the given entity i.e the music festival the film and tv festival the conference via that application process the other 25 35 percent is curated typically bigger names quote unquote are curated whether that's speakers whether that's bands whether that's films and that is a process of knocking on doors (laughs) meeting as many people as possible trying to get them to come to south by southwest to your question about the balance factor, I think that's that's a great question, fascinating question. Yeah, South by Southwest is primarily an event, a festival, a conference about discovery, about finding, hearing this cool new band that no one's ever heard of, but everyone's going to hear of in two years. Seeing a young filmmaker who you've never heard of before, but she's going to be absolutely famous in a couple of years. Seeing an entrepreneur who's got this idea for a startup that's not going to work, but the next startup, three startups down, is going to be really successful. So much of what we do is about 
young and emerging talent. That said, we also know that more established talent often attracts more media attention and it's easier to to sell often to our audience. So again, there is a delicate balance there between established content, established artists, established talent versus the up and coming stuff. I think realistically, we're probably 90, 95% up and coming versus 10%, 5%, 10% established. But the established stuff often gets more headlines, at least pre-event. It's easier to say, we're about AI and Sam Altman is our keynote. He's not our keynote this year, but people know who Sam Altman is as opposed to we're about AI and we're this guy who's going to be the next Sam Altman in three years. He's going to be the keynote. He's going to be great. Well, I don't understand that. So there. Interesting. Okay. So in what ways have streaming services and alternative distribution platforms impacted the landscape of festivals like South by Southwest? both in terms of content selection and audience engagement, and how do you see these platforms shaping future events? Significantly, how's that for an answer? (laughs) Certainly on the Film and TV Festival, one, it's in our very name. We were the film festival for ages, and now it's called Film and TV because so much of this content has moved to an episodic form and is absorbed in what we traditionally thought of as TV. Two, so many of our big, big screenings this year are things that they are screening at South by Southwest, but then they're going immediately to a streaming service. Our opening night film this year is Roadhouse, which is a remake of the Patrick Swayze film from, you know, 1989. This will be the only time it will ever be seen in a theater. It goes immediately to, I think, Netflix after that. So again, that's the landscape we live in that... The streaming services are doing so much of the cutting edge work at this point. And whereas 10 years ago, we were meeting with traditional Hollywood studios. Now we're meeting with the Amazons, the Netflix, the Hulus, these tech companies that now have a studio attached to them. The end result, I think, is still the same, that we're looking for content that is incredibly creative. That's what we're looking for across the board at South by Southwest, whether it's film or music or our tech companies. But what we see is that the format, the medium where this creativity plays out inevitably changes, morphs, transitions, and will continue to do so. I think one thing that South by Southwest has always done, at least in my mind, really well has featured Texas filmmakers. Every time that I've gone, I've seen incredible Texas films and documentaries. So every year that I've gone, I see mostly documentaries, and I've seen some incredible documentaries. It's been a while, actually, so shame on me. Let me say that that makes sense in terms of the overall vibe or approach of South by Southwest. I mean, our DNA, our ethos, our guiding light is creativity. And we would not have um, we would not have survived for thirty years if we weren't in an extremely creative city and a state that, for all its challenges and problems, it is still creative. Also, so we've always tried to showcase that creativity at South by Southwest. We didn't want to be limited to Austin films or Texas films or Austin talent or Texas talent, but certainly that is the pillar, the framework from which everything at South by Southwest springs. And again, that serves as the basis to this creativity, which is the DNA, the rocket fuel, the kryptonite, however you want to phrase it, that powers all things South by Southwest. How do you decide or vie for which festival gets what film? Do you you see what's coming out or you go to Netflix and I want your film or another festival is trying to get the film? Or someone comes to you, we want to premiere at South By? How does that work? Let me say with the context that I don't work directly on the film stuff, so I probably know the least about this. But I think it's very competitive between the bigger film festivals in terms of who gets the buzzy premieres. And by that, the Sundance, Tribeca, 
and those are two that are in the U.S. and that are roughly at the same time, but also the international film festivals. That said, I know that for South by Southwest, and I imagine for Sundance and Tribeca, you often create this relationship with a, a filmmaker or a creator in, in any kind of industry. And our biggest success on the film side was, or is slash was, Everything Everywhere All at Once, which was the opening night film in 2022. And then it did pretty well at the Academy Awards in 2023. Really neat. Also really neat that if you know the backstory, the directors behind that are two gentlemen, first name Daniel each. They call themselves the Daniels. They've been coming to South by Southwest for many years. They started with just doing music videos, then shorts, then their first narrative feature. I think that festivals, events, you build up these relationships with creators, with innovators, with entrepreneurs, artists that that can pay off. And something that I'm a little more familiar with because it was on the tech side, one of our watershed moments for the tech portion of South by Southwest, i.e. South by Southwest Interactive, was... 2007, when Twitter kind of launched at South by Southwest, you said you were there. But the similar story there is that Ev Williams had been coming to South by Southwest for several years. Really nice guy, had all these really cool startup ideas that, wow, that's really neat. Somehow, I'm the only one who thought it was neat. It didn't get too much funding. It didn't, it, it never really created traction with the mainstream. But wow, we were completely wrong in terms of our analysis of this thing, this new startup that he had called Twitter that he wanted to bring to South by Southwest, it, it immediately took off in the South by Southwest community and eventually hit the mainstream. And it's in a weird place now because it's no longer called Twitter and it's no longer Ever Jack or uh, Biz, but it is reflective of that idea of having people in your community that you cultivate that continue to come back to your event that help push your event forward. It is interesting to have gone in several different years and see that evolution of interactive and startup and all the incubators. It's really cool to see it. And all of that is happening more in the city as well. Yeah. I think it, it had a reverberation in Austin. Very much so. Well, back to the Twitter story and, and how much do we want to claim the Twitter story 15 years ago, but that's another conversation. But Twitter had so much success at South by Southwest in 2007 that the next year we grew a ton. Every startup in the U.S. and the, and the world wanted to be at South by Southwest to have that same kind of blow yeah, up. Yep. Yeah. And every VC wanted to be at South by Southwest to discover the next Twitter. And that was great for us. In some ways, it eventually became a little bit of an albatross of like, there wasn't a Twitter at South by Southwest this year. So it sucked. Well, 2009, Foursquare launched at South by Southwest. Foursquare never quite achieved the same mainstream appeal as, as Twitter did, but it was it had some push. There was also an Austin startup called Gowalla that launched in 2009 and got a lot of push. And then, you know, uh, 2015 was when we had another startup launched in 2015, and its name is escaping me, so I'm losing the story here. But again... This is a long answer to your question of, A, we saw a huge amount of growth, tech growth after Twitter. B, and aligns with some of the stuff we've talked about in the pre-interview here, is that the growth of South by Southwest and the transition from an event that was entirely focused on music to an event that had a, a really strong music component, but also a really strong tech component, that very much has paralleled the growth and changes of one sleepy college town, Austin, that has in the last 10, 15 years moved to become this kind of tech metropolis. And particularly during the pandemic, when the two cities in the US that saw the most growth, people moving from California, from other places to Austin and Miami, a lot because of the creative scenes, also a lot because of the tax situation. But again, in many ways, the growth of South by Southwest the changes and transformations of South by Southwest parallel the growth of the city, period. Back to my other thing. It was Meerkat I, I was thinking of. 
2015 Meerkat, Meerkat launched. Oh, gosh. And the through line there is that Meerkat did not last very long, but they certainly were kind of a precursor of Facebook Live. They forced Twitter to release Periscope two weeks earlier or a month earlier than they planned to. It was one more thing that, wow, there's a whole other life from social media that we didn't quite anticipate here. And look where we are now. Look at, said a little more seriously, I think that South by Southwest certainly benefited a ton from being at the right place at the right time on social media. And we grew a whole lot, and that's neat. That said, we all thought social media was going to make the world a better place. It was going to connect us in ways that we were not connected before. We were going to be able to communicate with people we haven't communicated with before, stay in touch with. And, and it has done that on many ways. But we also have to objectively look at this and understand that social media is responsible for a ton of our problems and challenges now, whether it's you know negative self-images of teenage girls or teenage boys, or, or whether it's this increasingly divided country and world where we live in, where because we're relatively anonymous on social media, we can say things that we would never say in real life. And maybe guilt is the wrong word, but I feel somewhat responsible that we were not more proactive in the day when we were in this social media boom about saying, we really need to think of all the great things that can happen here and all the negative things that can happen here if we don't take a, a more aggressive approach to regulating this thing, putting some guide rails on it. And I think that fits into where we are with AI now, where tremendous debate whether government should regulate AI. No, government should get out of the way and let AI do what AI wants to do. And I just say, look, let's learn from what we did wrong with social media and do this better with AI. And certainly, I think that is a lot of our push at South by Southwest in terms of AI, that we think this technology is great, but we also think that we need to learn from our mistakes with social media and be more proactive, more aggressive in terms of regulations on this. That was a long answer to your short question. That's a fantastic answer. I guess the interview's over. I mean, that's... <laughs> that mic drop. drop mic drop literally that answered that question so i'm going to just cross that one off we're in a news cycle that's constantly spinning how do you adjust or respond to unforeseen current events as they occur during the festival how do you adjust in real time on the one hand i think that a lot of our most popular content at the event is evergreen content talking about how to be innovative, how to be inspired, how to be more productive, how to be more creative. And that stuff, again, is kind of above the news cycle. But the news cycle is inevitable, and it plays a part in everything we do. In 2023, you may recall that the first day of South by Southwest was the day that the SVB crashed, Silicon Valley Bank crashed. So many of the sessions, the startup-related sessions, which were initially titled, How to Get Funding, became How to Secure Your Funding When Your Bank Has Gone Under. And so that was a, a real-life pivot, particularly for the entrepreneurs, the investors that were at South by Southwest. Another story that I think is better in a lot of ways was, I think, early 2010s. The first day of South by Southwest was the day of the big earthquake in Japan. And we had a grassroots effort called South by Southwest Gives that encouraged attendees and or people watching the event virtually or just following virtually to do micro donations that would be given to the Red Cross. And this was before micro donations were that much of a thing, but it was very illustrative of, wow, if you engage a large community. And if everyone puts in five bucks, it can amount to something special. And it was neat that we could promote this at the event, that people could feel like they were tangibly doing something to help with this huge destruction in Japan. So that was another scenario where the event pivoted and adjusted to a, a current event. I believe that was 2012 when the earthquake hit in Japan. Looking ahead, what are your goals and aspirations for the future of South by Southwest? And how do you envision the festival evolving? My goals are pretty big picture here. 
in the sense that I think that South by Southwest will continue to thrive and survive, will continue to be relevant if we continue to focus on creativity, on human creativity. And I think that human creativity is going to become even more important the more kind of AI applications we have. And I think face-to-face interactions that we do at South by Southwest are going to become even more important as part of us goes more virtual. So as long as we focus on creativity in all its many forms and pivot as needed, I think we will be relevant. And that's my goal, that creativity continue to be the DNA that, that powers everything we do here. In terms of the specific focus, that's also hard to say, but I will say that the things that we focused on at South by Southwest have always been very rooted in Austin, Texas. This started as a music festival, music conference and music festival in 1987 because the music scene in Austin, Texas was very strong. We added film in 1994 because you had these two young filmmakers coming out of Austin, Rick Linkletter and Robert Rodriguez, and there was this emerging film scene. We added tech in 1994 also because, hey, there's this guy in his dorm room who's selling computers that's going to be a big deal. More recently, 10 years ago, we added health and med tech to the event. Why? Well, certainly there's a huge influence of health and medicine, but also because the University of Texas had built a new medical school in Austin, and you could see that was going to have a big impact on what the city's DNA and personality was. So if we're thinking about the future, non-committal answer, but it sounds good. I don't know what South by Southwest will look like, but it will look a lot like Austin, Texas. So if Austin emerges as the capital of quantum computing, we'll be doing even more quantum computing at South by Southwest in 2030. If we emerge as the capital of sneaker culture all over the world. We will have much more sneaker culture at South by Southwest. So Don't say again, sneakers. That... <laughs> <laughs> sneaker con your... just in Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. But pick your creative industry that may emerge out of Austin that will have a large impact on what South by Southwest will look like. Any memorable moments or highlights from past South by Southwest festivals that particularly stand out to you? Certainly one of my most memorable moments, career highlight, mic drop or whatever, was getting to meet 44. That would be Barack Obama, who spoke, was a keynote in 2016. He was great. That led to us doing an event at the White House a few months later called South by South Lawn, which was a mini South by Southwest, one day mini South by Southwest on the South Lawn, as the name implies. But beyond having the opportunity to meet famous people at the event, I think for me and for a lot of our staff, what is most special about the event is just meeting creative people from all over the U.S. and all around the world who say, I love coming to this event. I meet new people. I make new connections. It's one of the highlights of my year. I mean, that is that is dopamine when you're doing when you're in the event business. Uh, hearing people say that it it makes the long nights and the long hours very much worth it. You've interacted with countless innovators and leaders at South by. Can you share any insight that has stuck with you over the years? I think the biggest insight. Personally, and from innovators that I've met with, is persistence is a huge part of what you're doing here. Sticking to it, failing, learning from your failures, trying to pick yourself up when you fail and learn and do better. That is certainly one of the keys of South by Southwest is that we've been around for a long while and we've made plenty of mistakes, but we've learned a little bit every year, grown a little bit every year, and that's led to something big. And again, I see that so often in innovators, creators, artists that I meet and interact with at South by Southwest. They're people who, you know, have practiced their craft for a long time, have faced lots of failures and learned from them and gotten better. Again, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but it is often very true that just persistence can get you lots of places. Where do you think Austin would be? If South by Southwest had never happened, what kind of city would it be? Would it still be that sleepy college town? 
No, I don't think it would still be the sleepy college town, but it may not have grown quite as fast as it has grown in the last 10 or 15 years. I, I meet numerous people who say, I moved to Austin because I came to South by Southwest and had a great time. My company moved to Austin because I had a great time. And I think South by Southwest put Austin on the map for a lot of people to help create this kind of brand Austin. I think something else probably would have done this if not South by Southwest, but we were lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time on this and get a lot of lucky breaks along the way. And again, helped Austin grow pretty quickly in retrospect. I think that we all wish we could have been more careful with that growth and plan that out a little better. Like the traffic patterns? Well, like the traffic patterns, like infrastructure and, and even more tricky, how do you balance the pay scale of the traditional creatives in the city, i.e. musicians, other kinds of artists, with the pay scale of creatives in the high-tech industry, which is much, much higher. And I don't think Austin is the only city facing that, but it's certainly an acute problem in a place like Austin, or acute challenge, shall we say. I am one of those folks who came to South By, then moved to Austin, <laughs> then married an Austinite, and then I spoke at South by Southwest. So You've done the whole thing. You I can have, mic I drop have, now. I can mic drop. I have checked all the boxes. So what do I win? Where's my swag, Hugh? You didn't get the gold <laughs> watch that's in the mail. I must have gone to the wrong address. <laughs> this next question comes from one of my coworkers. When is South by Southwest coming to Canada? When's the road trip? South by South on the road. We actually launched an event in Sydney, Australia in October 2023 called South by Sydney. Wrong direction. Sorry. Got the compass mixed up a few times. But point is that we're more open to expansion in other areas than we have been before. We did an event in Portland, Oregon called North by Northwest for a few years. We did an event in Las Vegas for a couple of years. So we have tried other events, other places. I will say the Sydney event was the most successful first year event we did in another city. And part of that is that Sydney is a very creative city, much like Austin. Sydney spent a lot of time studying what we did in Austin and pulled that off. Back to your original question, we like Canada. How's that for an answer? Canada likes you. <laughs> nice. All right. What's not to like about Canada? I know that you do a lot of nonprofit work. Any nonprofits that you want to plug in Austin? I like to be able to work with nonprofits. I've worked a lot with the Central Texas Food Bank on another project I do called the Austin Reggae Festival. I've been fortunate enough to be able to donate a lot of money to that great organization that helps feed hungry families in Central Texas. I've also worked a lot with a accessibility-related nonprofit in Austin called Nobility. They've done great things, and it's interesting to see that accessibility has gone from what I would term as a fringe thing to more of the DEI equation and conversation, and more big tech companies are considering this. I've also been fortunate enough to work with Austin Habitat for Humanity. They are a great organization that helps provide homes for people who can't otherwise have their own home, and just an honor to be able to contribute a small amount of my brain power to these great organizations. Awesome. We will share links also if you want to know more about South by Southwest. SXSW.com. All right, Joelle, speed round. If you could describe your work life in two words, which two words would you use? Persistent and tenacious. How's that? Great. If you were to choose between time travel and space travel, which one would you pick and why? Time travel for sure, because I think it's safer than space travel. <laughs> Worst case, you can get stuck some other time as opposed to get stuck in outer space and have to try to swim back. <laughs> That's great. If you had a warning label, what would it say? <laughs> Grumpy when hungry. Hangry. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> Much right? simpler. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's me too. <laughs> Hangry. Hangry. What is your favorite band or type of music? I'm a total sucker for bands with big horn sections. Love that. 
and I think there are going to be some pretty cool bands with big horn sections at South by Southwest this year. Do you want to say any bands or no? SXSW.com. <laughs> Spill the tea. Spill the tea. Okay, so we do a segment <laughs> called Question Down the Lane, where we ask our guest to give a question for our next guest. And so our last guest has a question for you, and that is... All right. Name one word you would use to describe yourself. Ooh, one word is difficult. That is so difficult. I'm going to come back with meditative. How's that? In that I'm at my best when I have time every day to sit and reflect, meditate, think about things, calm my mind down. And it's something I've picked up in the last 20 years. And coincidences or not, that's when Southwest started doing a lot better from my standpoint when I learned to do that. It is unfortunately something that I still tend to cut out of my schedule when I get really, really busy. And then I get back to it and I go, why did I cut this out? So meditative to the extent that's a one word answer. How's that? You, it's been a pleasure to have you on Podcetera. We thank you for spending some time with us. And we would like to wish you good luck with the festival, the event, the conference. All of it. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It is an honor, privilege, and a lot of fun to talk to you both. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share Podcetera. And be sure to follow and like the series wherever you enjoy podcasts. For Podcetera, I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Lodovich. Thanks for listening. See you next time.